Hello and welcome to This and That. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. And who everyone likes, Alyssa Sisney. Alyssa, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Do you see how we wear that? Like everyone might not like, you know. (laughs) But we do love you, Alyssa. So Well, I started getting the emails (laughs) where this guy goes, Oh, is Alyssa on from time to time? I'll watch more then. And I was like, yes. And oh, thanks. Um, yes. <laughs> so it's face. You're like, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This weekend I had to um ask Paul if I could take Alyssa's correction as opposed to his on a spin and then it worked. So that was like, you know, like a nice little like moment there. So then when I did my flying camel, he was like, oh, did Alyssa tell you about this? And I was like, no, no she didn't, you know. It's- <laughs> but also everybody's a little bit different. So sometimes someone's correction for something will work for you and sometimes it won't. So I think that like skating is very personal in that way. So like, you know, I mean, Paul is amazing. And I watch a few of your lessons and I'm like, I love his attention to detail. And everything is so good. Everything, everything, you know, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to discuss, and we have Alyssa on um, this week because Kevin Amos had a really rough skate at French Nationals, which was right after the Grand Prix final. And I know that I've gotten a lot of text messages from people asking like a lot of questions. And I think everybody is concerned for Kevin, alarmed and unsure what to make of what is going on. So I thought Alyssa, as someone who has had a performance on the public stage that didn't go well, that you could kind of walk us through. And one of the things that was interesting, I was just thinking about is that, you know, we're coming right off of the Grand Prix final. He only really had four days in between where they had to fly from China to France. You're going to be jet lagged as all get out and then having to get up again. And he didn't compete well at the final against his toughest competitor and he's against him again obviously that does play into all of this and Alyssa I was just remembering didn't you do a competition before Worlds in Nice right before with Carolina that also like didn't go great like right before that competition okay so can you kind of walk us through like what that's like because you're this coming is like a precursor is this a is this a tough thing to talk about it's I mean it's definitely not something you want to remember um but I think I warned her ahead of time we we, 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 just you know yeah (laughs) yeah and in in Kevin's case like for him and Adam both they literally just finished competing at the Grand Prix final and not only are you up for one of the biggest competitions of the year and you're against I mean you want to peak at the Grand Prix final and at Worlds because that's you know when you prove to the world that you're the best um, and for them to have to come back and compete at French Nationals four days later, I mean, I just watched the event, but I don't know when it occurred, but still it's like been less than a week and to do the time change and to like, I mean, I know that their Nationals is probably not as prestigious as U.S. Nationals, but it's still like you, it's your, the people that are supporting you. It's the Federation that's supporting you. It's maybe your family and friends. Like you want to, and all of the little kids who look up to you and you want to skate decent at least um and i don't think he even got a chance to recover from what happened I let alone like sticks with you right like me, your biggest for us for year, sure right like your biggest event of the year how you did like does stay with you right like not that it's like you feel it every day but like it sets the tone of how you even think about your year and what happened and and all of those things and especially the important ones. I was wondering if we, back into the where we were going um, before Worlds in Nice in 2012, I think it was you and Carolina did a competition there. For her, it went well and boosted her to be ready to win Worlds. For you, it went the other way. And at the start of that season, you had actually beaten her at um, Skate America. Now you had a problem with your hip, right? That you didn't fully understand what was going on. So I wanted to kind of ask like, where was your mental state and what did that do to your confidence, right? Because he's coming off of a really rough performance. Yeah. Where is the doubt and the indecision? Like you have a lot of time to think on an airplane, right? And it's <laughs> often not always the best thoughts. And then competition brings a lot out. So I was in a really unhealthy relationship the last time that I competed. And when I went out, you know, you get those thoughts of doubt 
And those thoughts were a lot darker than doubt and not about skating, right? Before I, and that's how I've talked about EMDR. And that's one of the big reasons that I decided to go on EMDR. And then I decided not to compete last year is because that person was a skater, right? So I kind of rearranged what I wanted in my life and in my nervous system to be like, I'm not going to be in this scenario ever again, you know, that have this happen. It's part of why I'm in like Placid and rereading, you know, redoing my life and stuff like that. But, you know, I was never going to put my nervous system in that state of stress or anxiety again. So I feel a lot for Kevin. And then I also feel for Kevin because while I was in that nasty relationship, I was with a coach who was also not um, a positive coach, right? And at that time, she made a comment that said that Kevin is a hilarious personality. He will only skate well once a year. You're like that, but 75%. And that always just like stuck to me, like every time he skates. And then to have someone say, they might be snowmobiling outside if that's what you hear. When you're like looking outside and you hear something, like someone's snowmobiling out there. Okay, just, just like letting you know. Okay, it's like the lawnmower going. Okay, so anyway, with um, when she said the Hilaric personality thing, I definitely watch. And then you think like, well, that's not true, but it may be tougher for me to fight through some traumas and things to do to realize my potential. And that's a lot of why I do EMDR and like you change your self image and, and things like that. So I definitely have like, a soft spot for when Kevin goes to try to understand what he's up against. And then knowing that someone picked up on similar traumas is like really kind of eerie, you know, but you thinking of that and thinking of when he competes. So I was just kind of curious, like your perspective on like the turnaround and everything like that, like what he might be going through because he had really bad falls at the Grand Prix final that seemed borderline dissociative right where he was experiencing a trauma and his mind and body were not working together at all you know these weren't just like he's not making a skating mistake it's not like you're telling him like move your left arm or something like that like this is much deeper yeah in my opinion it, it's i think it's hard because when you do have a bad competition if you're a skater that's not consistent to begin with I was not a consistent skater Kevin is not a consistent skater like you already have it in your head that already people are always telling you you're a head case and you're not consistent and then every time you make a mistake in competition you immediately go to that place where you're like they're right and I'm not consistent yes. so you you don't have like you know if somebody who's consistent misses a jump it's like oops but if if someone who's not inherently consistent misses a jump then it's like well I'm just proving them right that I'm not good so I imagine that whatever else is going on in his life that, you know, he just had a, a terrible Grand Prix final where you feel, you know, you feel awful because of how you skated. You feel embarrassed because, you know, this is the top six men in the world that have made it and you're like 40, 40 points behind. So you've like proven to everybody that you're not good, which isn't true. And we all know it's not true, but like you feel that way for sure. So he's, you know, he's coming from that and then he misses an a jump in in his program and it probably it's hard not to go there especially when he's had four days or mm. five days or whatever from the competition you know like he's still trying to recover from whatever happened there and he goes out and misses a jump and it probably in his head it's like I'm a disaster and I just want to quit and to have to go through a program where you just can't get out of it mm -hmm. is awful like people don't understand the guts that it takes to go out and fall apart on the ice. Like, I know that sounds weird to say, but like when you miss one thing, it's heartbreaking. And then you go out and you miss two things and you're like, I just want to get off. And I like want to fall through a hole and I never want people to see me <laughs> skate again, you know? So like it just to, to stay out there and finish the program. And he kept trying and he landed a couple jumps. Um, mm -hmm. But there was obviously something beyond skating going on out there. You didn't, pop after at your world's performance right you kept going and rotating what were you telling yourself like each time when you're going so it was a very weird thing happening going into the event and also the the challenge cup that I did beforehand I don't I was supposed to do for continents and then U.S. figure skating was like oh we don't want you to do that can you do this other competition for whatever pol political reason that they had you know mm -hmm. wanting to send other people somewhere or something but after the Grand Prix final of that season, I had twisted my ankle like the day before we competed. Um, and I didn't have a great skate there, but I kept twisting my ankle after that and not understanding that it was my hip that was weak. 
So every time I pick for flip and lutz, then my hip got weaker, but I didn't understand it because I was like, I was so excited because I like, I finally learned how to compete. I was with Yuka and Jason and I was like feeling like I had never been better in my career. And then suddenly some days I would come into the rink and I would do everything exactly the same. And I felt great. And I would literally miss everything in my program, which is not even possible. You know what I mean? Like, and I know I have the next day I'd come in, like, I don't understand what happened yesterday, but I'm going to try again today. And I would like, I would do clean everything. Like it was, there was no rhyme or reason for my inconsistency because I was doing all of the same training things. So it was the strangest thing. And I had kind of zero confidence going into worlds, but I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and everything physically felt good, except for like stretching in the morning or doing the first couple of double axles, which hurt. I was just like, you just don't, you don't accept that something hurts when you're at that level of your career. Um, when you're like, I can't not do worlds and I can't like, you just think it's a problem with yourself, not your body. And I wish I would have been aware of that, but I just thought it was me. And I was not, I had no clue what was going on. So part of my problem was the consistency going in, but not, not consistency in training, not consistency mentally, just literally my body would not work some days. Did your body, I guess. Your body feels different from day to day because I know like I have an SI joint problem, right? I also have sprained ankles. So it's very interesting to me that you're talking about that, the ankle to like hip, low back thing because mm. I have really bad sprained ankles and on the same side that I, my ankle got sprained, like my SI is like the right. So my right ankle, the right SI, and then the right here. I put my right vagus nerve is damaged from mm. situations from too much stress um, for the last two years since I competed so and it's gotten like much better but it's something that that's why I do cold showers I lay out on an occiput still point inducer like I do all of these things to calm this down and then to calm down my nervous system so I think it's very interesting when Kevin is probably like in a very agitated state and I work with Karen Cornell and she talks a lot about like calming the nervous system down like yesterday I went snowshoeing outside in the snow you hear the crunch you hear the water like it's all good for you and put you in that space and I was thinking for Kevin like he must be just like in such a state of if you don't know what's going on and then you go out again it's not gonna go well right like he had no amount of time and you're in front of your federation and no one really is excited to see their federation right at the end of the year like that's it's it's a tough moment for everyone at nationals and yeah Jonathan I guess what's that like in opera like do your does your voice just ever feel different one day than another? Oh, because, because this area also, like we're thinking about our hips all the time, also with our breathing and things like that. So there is a huge hip connection to what we do, but this area can hold so much like energy and anxiety will like immediately lift the the chest up and it will like grip here and do all these sorts of things. So m my equivalent is being on major stages and basically losing my voice suddenly having okay. no sound come out when you need it in the in the biggest are you giving me a thumbs up <laughs> there's like oh, a weird bubble feature i that saw that too like, that's a weird thing no that was not um, none like, of us did that my hands are over here so but that does happen from time to time on the new zoom yes okay them. okay got it got it the fans, uh, they're just they're applauding yes yeah. And, and it, it, what what we're dealing with here, and it, it's in both instances, is sort of like sort of this invisible problem, because when it's internal, like mm -hmm. I don't see that, like oh oh my finger is twisted and I cannot play the piano today. It is all internal, and the more anxiety there is, the tighter my body will get, and it will like start to go into these sort of trauma responses, and it's just compiling itself and making it so ridiculous. And Alyssa, to your point. I could warm up the same. I could have the same routine of sleep, of vocal care, all this sort of stuff. And it felt like I was leaving it all to chance every time. But really for me in those moments, the common denominator was more what was happening internally within my body, often as a result of stress, as a result of nerves, as a result of something that actually had very little to do with voice. And, and the equivalent is sometimes you're in the middle of an aria and you sense like the audience is feeling uncomfortable, you know it's not going right. And there's that part inside of you that's like, should I just walk off? Yeah. Just, let's just call it. Like, like, you know, like, what do they call that? Like, um, in like a, I don't know, some team sport when you're being beat by too much as yeah. a kid, yeah. like a slaughter rule, like that. Like, let's just end the pain for both of us and I will just leave. 
And I have to say, one of the first times I saw that happen was Jeremy in Sochi when he took that really hard fall on the mm. quad mm -hmm. in the short. And you saw like there was almost this this moment where he didn't know what was happening. And then I thought to myself in real time, oh my gosh, is he wondering if he should stop? Like, and I so identified with that. And there was a bit of that happening with Kevin here as well. Like as he would skate around a corner or do these things, I was like, I wonder if one of the many voices that must be going through his head is, do we just stop? Do we make yeah. it stop and, and hope that's the best move here? It's it was really hard to watch. And I have to say, um, when people will accuse us um, on the show of being non-sympathetic or, you know, too harsh on skaters, but especially, you know, when we're like, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? But to see some of the the fan responses to Kevin's sort of situation here was was rather upsetting. As um, and Amber too. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm not an athlete, but I'm a performer, and so I'm empathizing. Like, of course, Kevin knows that did not go well. But these comments, <laughs> like, how did he get to the Grand Prix? And like, la la la. I was like, by skating to amazing qualifying events. What are you talking about? Like, obviously, there's something going on, and we don't know what we don't know. But to me, it was tragic, not angering. And I, yeah. I wondered also just reading into the body language, Alyssa, I don't remember what the, the kiss and cry would have been like for you in 2012, but even seeing Kevin here, he was sort of like disassociating. And I don't know the two women on either side of him, obviously not Sylvia, but they were sort of leaning in and talking and like giving corrections and this and that. I, I wasn't catching exactly what they were saying, but I thought, I don't, I don't know that that's helping right now. Maybe let's all <laughs> just be quiet. Maybe just give up. Yeah. And, and we'll we'll figure this out later. But the physical, like, coming in on him from both sides, like, uh, my body started to react, even watching it. I found it, I found it very upsetting to watch. So yeah, I hope he has, yeah. I hope he has support because they, and like I said too, like, you know, he you make a mistake and that happens, but it's, it's so hard coming off his Grand Prix final skate and making an, a mistake. And then he probably immediately went to that place of like, I'm not any good. What am I doing? What What am I doing here? Like every, all of those people who commented are right that I'm just not any good, which like when you're in that place that is slightly dissociative because you're on the ice and it feels unreal sometimes when you're stuck in that, like, you thought that you did everything to prepare and then you're out there and something goes wrong and you just can't get out of it. And you're like, I'm ruining my dream. Hmm. I think the problem is, is that when you start disassociating in those moments, you start disassociating regularly. Right. And I think that that's. Because you do what you learn. And if, if, if you are not able to get out of it, you, you just think that's how it happens for you. Yeah. Almost like it's out of your control and in this is just, who you are and or not who you are but like you know no matter what you do to try to get better it's not going to happen this is you and so you're like <laughs> and it's really hard to work I think the problem is is that when a skater like this has traumas we're talking about Jenny with her last night and she's you know traumas are never your fault but then recovering from it is your responsibility and that's a really hard thing especially when <laughs> you're dealing with the pain that caused those traumas in the first time. Like it's a real, uh, you know, sandwich to kind of like deal with, but you know, or they call it the black night of the soul or whatever you want to call it. But I think for Kevin, I can understand why as a skater, you want to go to Europeans because you understand that if you don't get to go to Europeans, you're viewed as being over or that the Federation has given up on you. And this is where you need really smart people and know that there are a lot of skaters who are very successful that have a lot of traumas, right? And I think that when you look at Amber, or you look at Kevin and you think like, okay, Amber's doing so well landing the triple axel and then not putting the end of her program together. And this is someone that's training full programs, right? So people go, oh, get a sports psychologist. And like, no, it's not about, that's not necessarily about like sports psychologists. It's going to get you to train where you don't want to train. Like this is this is your view of yourself that then you do well and then you feel inherently unworthy and then things start going wrong, right? Well, and I then can't remember if we were talking to Jenny about this or someone else at one point where they were like, sports psychologists sometimes they found were just, again, sort of like giving you ways to push through 
instead mm -hmm. of maybe actually deal with with maybe something personal that you need to deal with that will ultimately help you heal. Um, yeah. and so so many people that maybe had to heal something, instead were giving tips on like how to kill that warm up. And it was like, well, maybe this is maybe this is a bit deeper than that. And it should mm -hmm. be said also like you need that that time to clear. And this is something we talked about a little bit with those constant Gracie articles that came out. She had several tough skates. There were several tough moments. And every month there was an article that was like, I'm all better now. I've learned a whole bunch. And I was like, with all due respect, you can't have learned what you need to learn or heal what you need to heal in a month's time and come out the other side. And we were getting that so consistently. And like this turnaround, if Kevin needed time to process, to figure out how to move forward from the Grand Prix final, that time was not given to him. And even though Adam did not have a disastrous skate here, Adam also was obviously not at his finest either, given the circumstances, yeah. you know? Yeah, so I, I would go back. Speaking of Gracie, this spurred two things that you made me really think of that I wanted to kind of discuss is that I think in 2016, everybody saw that Gracie was in the best like condition of her career and the best program is the best moment to go for it. But then that's a worthiness thing too. But when we look back, remember it came out after those world championships that her father had lost his medical license for allegedly something with urine from another patient for tests. And like, that's a huge trauma and things going on in the background of her life which would have then maybe put her in the perspective of being the breadwinner for the family and like a whole lot of stuff. And you can imagine that probably the people around her weren't very calm before that competition, knowing what's going on. And then we saw the reactions that kept happening and how it kept going downhill. And I think for her, I think in a lot of these cases, it's probably the best to take a step back and to look and that it doesn't like end your career. Like I think Kevin, I look at like he's got two years to the Olympics, you know, like he can mm -hmm. make a lot of improvement by then. I wouldn't worry about Europeans at all. I don't know. What would you both advise for Europeans and him knowing that it's not that long, you know, from now? I mean, it, he for sure has the advantage of being from a small federation where like they're still going to send him anyways because he is amazing and he deserves to go. And this last two performances have no like as a federation, I would hope that they say, look, we know something is going on. We want to help. We think you're amazing. We think you will do amazing. What can we do to help? Um, but most federations, and it's hard, especially like with your figure skating, where you have a lot of other people who also could make it, then you did, that's the end of your season. And then it could be the end of your career. Um, so I think in Kevin's case, at least he has the opportunity to go to Europeans and world, I'm assuming. Um, you know, yeah. and I don't think it's... In 2011, do you remember that Rachel Flatt was fined for her performance at the World Championships because Mariah didn't go, right? Okay, because so... Uh, this was a weird set of circumstances. Can you walk us through was. this? Yeah. I don't understand what happened because Worlds obviously didn't happen in Japan because of the tsunami, uh, the earthquake and the tsunami. And then we were fortunate enough to have Worlds in April. And we went and Rachel, being Rachel skated, pretty good but it was weird because she's always so consistent and I think she missed because she ended up 12th or something right um and I don't remember her being injured I don't really remember the situation and then afterwards people were upset because we didn't get three spots no we sorry we didn't yeah we didn't get three spots um which happens people were obsessed <laughs> with when the U.S. lost three spots people became obsessed and traumatized yeah. with getting them back and I think it was worse is that at the time the ladies were all really bunched in ability right so if one of you had a bad day you could always point to someone else and be like well they're better but nobody yeah. was consistent all throughout the season and Rachel was the most consistent skater she ever. was and I, I if she, she injured or not like I don't understand why they find her because it was without precedent as far as I am aware and I don't remember if they find her because she didn't tell them or they find her because she went and they knew she wasn't like, I don't remember the circumstances surrounding the fact that they find her, but that is the one and only time that I've ever heard them do that. And I think it's mm -hmm. very unfortunate and was wrong. Yeah. Do you think you inspire her to do better now that she's afraid to receive a fine? Well, also like, she was, if she was injured and did not tell them, then she was clearly afraid of them 
taking everything away also, which happens. So it, or maybe probably as an athlete, she thought I'll be fine. I can work through this and I can still do my best because that's what we're taught to do. So you're not taught to disclose your injury. And unless you're literally hobbling and you can't skate, you're supposed to go and compete. So I'm assuming that she did what she has been taught all of her life. I, I don't remember personally, like I thought she was skating fine and I don't remember anything in particular or even what the injury was. So the fact that they find her, they were trying to make a point, but they never did before or after. I just remember we were at Skate America <laughs> in 2016 and okay. we're in the downstairs. And it's when Gracie got off the ice, she had a troubling skate. She showed up not ready. Mm. Uh, this was post Boston world where she post probably Boston. could have won and had one mistake. Yes. But and was like, still amazing. Like she didn't amazing. bomb. Yeah. She was great. But I treated it like she bombed. You know, she was four. I think the world treated it like she bombed. I mean, she, sorry, not the world, but like the American figure skating world. She, it got progressively worse to be at competitions and see what went down backstage. And I will say this until the end of time. I will always remember Gracie being alone and Meryl Davis coming and finding her and like taking care of her at 2017 nationals. And it was just like, oh. it really spoke to Meryl Davis's character. Oh, hey, <laughs> so whatever these icons are that are coming up, now that one was a thumbs down in this spot. Oh, no! I, I, I don't like, know what it is. Meryl's kindness is deserving of a thumbs down, which I would just oh. like to iterate for the viewers before the comments explode. That this I'm not even seeing it on this side. So if anyone knows what's causing it, I'm not even seeing the emojis happening, but it's... <laughs> I don't know. Meryl's kindness <laughs> was, was like, why is this a crime? It, it is such like Sorry. a beautiful moment. It was like, you're talking about. It's like, but I was like, was like, like, like really no. being like authentic. And like, I was like, Meryl was so nice. And like, I she remember like, the girl could barely, like, it was backstage at 2017 Nationals. I don't know if she knew where her mind was emotion you know like what's going on and Meryl found her and like walked her walked her away from the media away from everybody in U.S. figure skating like got her out That's of amazing. there and it was amazing and I, I think that that was like a really telling moment and I think that people always tell you to push forward right and there was a so there was a conversation at Skate America when Gracie was made some really dark comments and we had like a I had a fierce debate with Christine Brennan and I was like no she needs to take the whole year off Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, she's crazy gold. Like, you know, she she can't. And I bet you if that happened today, our conversation would be completely different because so many things have changed about athlete mental health and these documentaries and stuff since then. But I remember- I about that. that even, sorry to jump on this, about Simone and the twisties, that I found there was a, a great deal of um, a generational gap in how you viewed that. I found that a lot of people younger than me immediately thought, good for her. They what also was, weren't, they weren't talking about a lot of the situations going on in Simone's life and they still haven't. Yeah. And a lot of these are like imbued with racism and image and stuff. But you have to remember Simone's brother, her, I think it's her biological brother from her mom because remember she has the blended family. So it's hard to, sometimes the, the family tree gets confused with like, like who, how is this all, you know, related? Because her biological brother was in, because remember her grandparents adopted her. So some of her like aunts and uncles have become kind of like her siblings, right? Because the tree, the tree like collapsed, right? So um, he was in a murder trial. And I believe that there was someone agitated by that and that there were bad incidents for hearing, right? So one, they didn't want to talk about the fact that it's kind of like when Liz and Jared competed at the Olympics and all you remember is like, here's Liz Punselin and her brother killed her father, right? And they just like announced that on TV, right? And I think that they didn't want that with Simone so that they kept that quiet. But all of those things that led up to the twisties and all of the pressure on her and everything. And I feel like people 
if you don't understand what's going on, I think people get really angry when they don't understand. But at the same time, if people don't let out certain information, it's because everybody's going to obsess over it and everyone's going to say, here's Simone and her brother was just in a murder trial, right? Like as you're going to do your balance being routine and that's how you become defined. But yeah. I also think some, I mean, in this day and age with social media and everyone shares their most innermost thoughts and trauma, I feel like... <laughs> Most people don't want to talk about what's going on in their life. And I have gotten many times, and I'm sure most athletes have, is like, oh, you're in this, like you've put yourself in this sport. So you like people are allowed to talk about your personal life, which is not why we enter sport. Right. You know, like none of us have entered a sport and given the public, you know, the opportunity to see our private lives. We don't, most people don't want that. And most people who enter sport enter sport because they love the competitiveness of it or you're drawn to whatever you know, in figure skating that you love and you, you become successful and you just by becoming successful doesn't mean you're giving permission to the media or the public or your fans or your not fans for information about your private life. And of course, knowing as a fan, knowing something going on in your private life generally would make them more empathetic towards you. It's so hard to never announced his divorce, right? Officially, like they never had like that big we got divorced announcement. So when you got married to him, I can't tell you how many text messages, emails, whatever I got being like, but isn't Kurt married to someone else? And you were like, that's been over for a long time. You know, they didn't um put out a press release, you know, and it's it's weird how people they feel that it's owed to them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and in it's like when you watch the stuff about the royal family. I mean, like they didn't sorry, back to my situation for a minute. You don't need to publicize your divorce. It's private. You want to protect your children. You want to you don't want people to start talking about it because it's you're not traumatic. Elite, right? Like you're not And even then I'm sure like does she really want people talking about her divorce? You know, like it's traumatizing for mm -hmm. whomever is going through that situation in whatever way. And you don't want to share your bad news or your bad things or, you know, you just, so it's like, but I was watching the thing. I can't remember if it was the thing about Harry and Meghan or, or whatever, but like when they were talking about how England as a country expects that because they have the Royal family, that they are allowed to know everything about the Royal family. They, they mentioned that in some way. And I thought that was so apropos about like figure skating where figure skating, just in general, people who are, successful in sports the fans feel like part of being a fan is that you owe them part of your personal life london's wild too so in the uk how they deal with the press which is another way that we don't even understand this i was there in 2007 obviously like blogs were big at the time but you know in the morning in the uk everyone has their you know tea or their coffee and they're getting on the tube to go to work and everybody is like very buttoned up and at five o'clock they pass out those like trash rags that are like tabloids like we've never seen in the US, okay? And like mm. some of it is planned publicity and some of it is crazy drumming up oh, stuff. Interesting. We were even talking about in the David Beckham documentary, which then I watched and thought was so excellent, which I didn't know much about him, even though I think I had a poster of him at one point. Um, but it was, it was something about like, was it the World Cup where he was like kicked out of the game or whatever that was and like, just they smell blood and they just go for it and that was also a line from i tanya that i really remembered when she's margot robbie is is tanya is talking about like yeah america loves to love somebody but they really love to hate somebody too and it's so easy to just throw someone that they feel is not delivering under the bus I mean, did uh, you ever see the olympic trials with vanessa atler in 2000 mm -mm. This was the first time that Bella Caroli was going to pick the team instead of the scores. By the way, in almost every sport, unofficially to quite officially, the Federation knows who they want to pick much prior to these competitions. They are essentially an exhibition. And if you actually look in the bylaws of the Olympic procedure, it's completely legal for them to do that. So we were sitting in Nashville in 2022. And remember with COVID and that those people were on the team and you kind of knew who was going to make it. But remember when Ilya skated well, we were sitting next to someone who was texting with Lori Parker and it was like, no, Jason's on the team, it's fine. Mm. 
And I remember I gave a show where I like really explicitly like made my case for why I actually would have put Ilya on the team in that selection procedure, loving Jason's skating so much. Yeah. But based on what we saw and knowing that Vincent had locked up the spot at Skate America, that it almost had to go to him, right? Based on who was winning competitions that year. And it was just really interesting is because if you look back in the history of figure skating and these things, they almost always have the team picked. Did Tanya Kwiatkowski really have a great shot going into Nagano when the three of them were on the Campbell's soup cans? By the way, Campbell's was a sponsor of U.S. figure skating. So yes, they probably told them or had discussions about which three faces to put on. They could have just put Tara and Michelle on those if they wanted to, right? Like they put three people on those cans. And this has happened in so many Olympics time after time after time. Well, Vanessa Atler wasn't making the team in 2000. She had a completely meltdown at that trials. And when they sat in the room to announce the team, they just kept the camera on her the whole time. Like mm. to catch if she was going to like, this was an 18 year old, right? Like they probably owe her like a huge settlement like today, right? For like how they handled that. But just like an interesting way that we view things when you go in for the kill that director knew that she was the story regardless well, it's the sort of phenomena of like trauma porn do you yes. know what I mean? and quite frankly that's what even the truce of a outburst uh at the olympics felt like i i thought like she doesn't want to be doing this in front of people mm -hmm. she needs to be yeah. alive. She needs to be yeah. processing this in private she's not trying to make this a show she just yeah. doesn't have the privacy to to process this right now, and it's just coming out. And those cameras were ready. And it, it was hard sort of for him too. Like it's getting to the point where because Adam has the jumps and he skates with a certain machismo, he's getting the components. And I think for every sensitive person who works on their edges and who works on their skating as a craft when the person who doesn't then starts getting their points arbitrarily because they can land the jumps. But if you look at what Adam does with his ankle, it's nowhere close to what other top skaters are able to do. I think that that has to be really hard for you because then you go into another mental spiral that no matter what I do, they're gonna give the other guy the points. And that has to be really tough too because Adam, because he's landing the quad lots and now he's trying a quad flip, even though it has a horrific wrap on it, they're going to put it in for the points, right? As long as he can stand up on it, it's going to be worth it, essentially, if the judges overlook things, right? Then you start to feel like you're losing a winning, like you're, you know, you're in a it's, losing. I also think like having been there and been figure skating for a long time is, it's not even like, it, there's a weird rut that the mm -hmm. competitive skating world falls into where, when you start not getting the points, as you've been speaking of, like Kevin, who should be, you know, getting interpretation of a 10, most of the time, maybe not here, but that was an exception. Um, and in choreographically and in, of course, skating skills, but you start to not get the points because you're not doing the jumps. And even when you do the jumps, they don't give you it if, you know, someone else is landing quad everything. Um, the, it's a weird thing in the sport of figure skating that you also start to feel like you're not deserving as a person or mm. you're not good enough as a person, right? Like it somehow people treat you as that it's a, not that it's a personal thing because of course your skating is personal, but like as a personal, how good you are as a person. I don't know how to explain that. And I think I'm looking this up because I remember Gracie had a quote because her book is coming out. And she said, um, I couldn't remember the last time I had been accepted for being a good person as opposed to a great athlete. And I, I read that today and I was like, that's how it started to feel is when you didn't skate well or when you couldn't skate well, people didn't think of you as a good person, which no is value. so wrong. Yes. You have no, you have no value, but also like you must be, you must not be a good person because you the results are not coming to you or you must be doing something wrong in your life because you're failing like people said the most awful things to me when I didn't skate well to your face oh yeah 
Yeah. Mostly not to my face because people aren't that bold. Is it like or... the Hawaii comment where that woman went up to her at the competition? <laughs> people make comments like that, but you know, over email or whatever. To me, before, yeah, mm, yeah, most of the yeah, most of the time they're not. Most of the people don't have the guts to say it in person. And if they do, then at least you're gonna have a conversation. Or and usually yeah. you can see that there's something going on with them as well when they say something like that. To <laughs> on their energy, right? It's much different from my computer yeah. screen. Yeah, but but I notice, and it's like. You know, once you're out of the competitive skating world, it's so much. It seems so silly to say that it felt like that existed. But when I was in it, I really felt that from other people. And when I skated poorly at Worlds and missed everything and still tried, like I didn't try to miss. I didn't. I tried my best to try every jump and rotate it. And I just ended up on my butt every time. Um, After that, even there and after that, people didn't talk to me. People that were my friends did not talk to me. People that knew me, did they just like, and I understand that if someone has a bad skate, you don't know what to say. But I had other people, other specific friends that spent that whole day or that whole like evening with me to make sure I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, I don't know what they said to me. Like, I don't remember that, but I remember that they didn't want me to feel alone after that happened. And most people just left, like didn't talk to me, didn't include me in things for days weeks months after that like because it was like it was contagious yeah I it fired. was like I was suddenly a bad person like it's wild how people treat you and I'm assuming that is just a competitive sport thing that people just fall into that mindset but I don't you know so like Kevin is probably also going through that as many of us that can say positive supportive things of him he probably is only hearing the people that say you deserve to skate badly. You're a bad person. You're doing, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard not to hear those and think that they're right because you did skate badly. Did you ever have a coach be nasty with you after a bad performance who saw how hard you were working before? No. Um, and especially with Yuka and Jason, they they were the ones that got me to skate well, but also supported me. And even in a skate that was terrible like that, they still supported me because they knew I tried. And the only thing they ever asked was that we tried our best. And they could see that I, you know, I wasn't throwing the event. There's something called a, a validating witness in trauma. And often, right, and often people who experience trauma, if you don't have someone in your life who is a validating witness, then it's hard to ever acknowledge or um, move on from that. And if you have, especially, a, and it has to be a person that's important in your life, a coach or a mentor or a very good friend or a teacher um, and I think if you don't have that, especially in figure skating, you can go down the wrong path really easily because the people around you who should be supporting you through those hard times are gone or they're blaming you for it, which is even worse. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that I fired a coach because after a bad performance, they gave me the silent treatment and I was done. Because I knew there, was- There's one thing, if if you know that you've gone out there, you didn't work hard, you didn't do what your coach said, you you aren't prepared like you know when you've gone to a competition you're not prepared and it's your fault and when your coach you know tells you that and you know it that's one thing but most I mean how many of us really ever go to a competition unprepared didn't work hard you know it maybe happens at a summer competition for some people occasionally but like nobody goes to a competition not having tried to prepare their best I thought I wanted to ask you because we're talking about Kevin and how you know, Adam is now getting these component scores that seem very high, even in skating skills and interpretation for his ability. How did Jeremy deal or what did you see? Because at that time when he was against Evan and Johnny, they were all three very good skaters, right? Johnny had a lot of natural ability. I think there were people that thought that that was kind of some of his ease and glide was kind of taken out of his skating because they had changed styles and Galena is very obsessed with things looking masculine and big in a very specific way that I think worked against the fluidity of his skating that people fell in love with with Priscilla, the way that he would like sink into the edges and it would just be a little bit more delicate. So you have that, but he was so yeah. famous at the time, right? And everybody wanted to talk to him, right? And then everybody wanted to talk to Evan because he was taking modeling, you know, photos at the time and he was winning and he could will himself to do these things. But artistically, it was flex feet and a lot of arms going around. But everybody is talking about Johnny's fame, Evan's winning. And then you have Jeremy, who's probably better than both of them. 
but not having that kind of magnetism because of whatever self-belief is going on. So like, what did you witness in that scenario? Because I imagine for him, that must have been very frustrating, but then he skates well at nationals and then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, we loved you all along. But it's like, no, we really didn't. You know, like they really kind of ignored him. Because I remember covering those Olympics in 2010, right? And the PR people, oh my God, it was black and white. It was Evan and Johnny. And like the subtext was straight versus gay, right? Was going into this. Jeremy sure, was actually. You know, like those were th those articles were about. I can't remember the context going in, but didn't Jeremy win the Grand Prix final? Yes. Or that was 2008, he, or was that nine? 2008, 2009, he won the Grand Prix final, and then he won nationals that year. And then he didn't do well at Worlds, and that was kind of a... And then he left Tom Z and went to Yuka. Right, and I was there for that season of it. Um, it's interesting because I think... I mean, of course, Jeremy is competitive and Jeremy wants to win and he is one of the best skaters I've ever met in my life. But I also think that Jeremy personally cared about what he gave to the sport or what he brought to the sport. So he wasn't interested in the fame that came with it. He wasn't interested in, I mean, of course, he's interested in winning, but he also wanted to be true to how he felt about skating. If I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but like impact results in a weird way. Like look at the results that Yuzu would get, and you know, like when you become that famous, yeah, your mark, you start to reflect that, right? Like it's and and it's so arbitrary in a way. I mean, when you watch skater, you can watch a juvenile at regionals, and you can see that some one of those kids like just has the it factor that the other ones don't, but that doesn't mean that they're going to make it. You know, in any respect, it's just there's something there that you can't teach. And on the reverse side of it, sometimes you're at nationals and you don't understand why this skater is getting all the marks because you just don't see it. And I felt like in a, in a space of like Jeremy and Johnny and Evan were sort of all equals in a way because they all had something different going for them, but it was how they were promoted and it was how they were politicked. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I mean, I don't remember specifically the skating or, or what led to the way it was. So it just felt like Jeremy was the third wheel in that rivalry. And the they third didn't wheel give and him also the best. Marks the yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. they, nobody was in, nobody was really caring about <laughs> the skating skills yeah. in a way mm. that, that they... Jeremy brought, you know, and, and I think that he, the more that he did that, the more, U.S. figure skating realized that what he has is so special. I always just felt that Jeremy wasn't comfortable speaking the way that the other two were in giving interviews and that he would get himself in trouble, but also like backed in, right? And I remember before Sochi, he was trying to say something that Jeremy was not fully out at the time, right? But they were asking about the Sochi anti-gay propaganda laws. And he said something and you could tell like he didn't know what to say, right? He's a gay athlete going to Russia, not fully out, but everybody in skating knows that he's gay, but he hasn't like declared this to planet earth, right? And they asked him about something and he said some comment like, well, I wouldn't go and change the drapes. And I remember, that a reporter went after him for that. And it was it's, I, yeah. I remember that. And I, I know, I don't think that they were, I think they were told not to say anything. I don't know this for certain. I do remember that there was no, here's what you should say. Here's what you shouldn't say. Here's a good way to and phrase what we think. How not have had that? They knew that kind of question would be coming up. Like it's a very- I think, they didn't, I think that they did not want to address it themselves. And I, uh, um, I know Ashley spoke out very well. And they, um, this and is the that has been obsessed with people not seeming gay for decades, right? Like, think about that in the history of skating, right? And it, now, yeah. on a dime, become like, we're here, we're queer, and we're going to Russia. You know, like, they don't know how to handle any of that. They're like, well, how should we handle? Because we're going to lose sponsors if we, you know, like, they're not. Yeah, that's true. I think also, like, some people are innately more comfortable speaking or sharing their life like we were talking about at the beginning where the fans feel like they owe that you owe them your private life and some people are more than happy to give more of themselves and some people 
and and this is what I was sort of talking about with Shoma that I you know didn't say that I don't love his skating, but I I don't connect with him as well as I connect with say Kevin and you know Shoma may be really shy and maybe he's really like not comfortable sharing himself and that's why he is a perfect skater just not vulnerable to us mm. and I think that some people are innately like not comfortable speaking or sharing their private life and their public personas and so sometimes then I think they get more hated for that because they're just shy or not willing to share and they're they of course are like you know they have their own personalities and they have their own stories and they have their own traumas and they have all of that that we just don't know about so then we're not as compassionate as we are to someone who is spilling over everything that is going on in their life and that's that's a personality thing and that's a comfort level with sharing that you know I was certainly not one to share anything going on in my life yeah especially I I think also of the ages of a lot of these skaters like for so many of us, like an emotional trajectory, like recovering from dramas and all these sorts of things, it takes time. And as I get older, I become more empathetic. I become more mm-hmm. honest with what I am actually going through in certain moments. And I think, and, and I don't say this with any disrespect, but not only are they at a young age, but it's sort of a sheltered community, which in yes. some emotional ways makes that age even younger. In, in, in it, For sure. Yeah, and you're yeah. taught to suck it up, right? You are trained yeah. to suck it up to get through training every day. And sometimes we have said in certain skating scenarios, there's sort of that question where it seems like Yuka and Jason were the adults in the room for you when you needed one. That in many circumstances, there is no grounding adult in the room. If we're talking about people needing emotional safety, grounding, centering, all this sort of stuff, emotional definition. And the people around you don't have that. It's just this perfect storm for unending chaos, I think. And I don't I don't wish that situation on anyone. Do you send Kevin to Europeans? I personally wouldn't. And I would tell him to go to an island that week. Go to Hawaii. Go to Bali. Take that vacation that you've always wanted to take with a book. Don't take terrible cell reception. The worse the cell reception, the better, right? Make it so that you actually can't load the video of Adam Siohim Fa at Europeans. God forbid he wins and you're Kevin and you have this person. That's Assuming represent- that's even what's driving this. I know there is the rivalry with Kevin and and, and Adam, but maybe that's way not more than that. Fun. It's way more than that, but it's it's a um Whatever Kevin has going on is personal, right? Adam, through no fault of his own, happens to do well at a moment that Kevin is fading. And that's why I'm saying no matter what, because they have been peers and very neck and neck, if Adam goes to Europeans, he's got a very good chance that he could win. Kevin should not watch that competition. You know, like, great for Adam, achieve, but it has nothing to do with Kevin, what's going on in his life right now. When is your pain? It's the first week of February, end of January. Like it's a month from now ish. Later than that, I can't remember. Because also, because also, do you think if whatever's happening in Kevin's life, if if it's a situation that can be dealt with and and he can get back to training, do you think that doing Europeans would be a plus for him because it would at least go out and do half of your jumps, like you know, lower the difficulty content and just stand up on your feet and gain a little bit of confidence because do you want this to be your last competition before worlds and have a positive moment with that yeah even even because the 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 year that carolina won worlds in 2012 she came to skate america in 2011 and she didn't i don't remember she did flip and lots so she did one flip like she she had a lowered content she added the flip in right before Worlds. and so right every competition she was adding a little bit more content content but also adding more confidence in her I and i don't i can't remember if she was injured and that was why but like instead of going to a con- and then falling she just added confidence by staying on her feet and maybe that's what kevin needs at europeans Second, that's was it Al- you know pardon at the event aljona aljona leonova was second with the pirates of the caribbean program. i mean I'm, I'm mixing program this shows you how unimpactful but it was ca- controversial at the time that carolina won i think that was 2011. i was randomly there you which were one there. Yes. yeah you were there with jeremy but i ran into you and your mom the day after 
You were like walking oh. in a park and I was randomly with Jeremy and his mom. I oh. bet you Melissa doesn't remember oh. because she probably doesn't remember a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. and that's fair. And that's fair. I was so, thinking- really Sorry you had to see that in person. And I was like, you have to take these rehearsals off. I'm going to Nice. And they're like, oh, are you singing in Nice? And I was like, no, there's a figure skating event. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry you had to see my performance in person. Well, January 8th is European. So January 8th to the 14th. Mm. That's fast. Then I don't I don't think you should do it because I think that I think it would better it would be better to have more solid training to to recover, to have more solid training and to, to bring himself back out. If there's something before world like the challenge cup or something, maybe do that. But I think that January eighth is really soon. I think the first thing he needs to do is calm his nervous system down, completely relax, and then go back, right? And and maybe be around sunlight and like positive things because you're in such a bad environment and it's cold and it's dark and take yourself out. That's what I would advise, you know, like just take yourself out of whatever environment you're in. I don't think he's going to turn it around by Europeans. And I think that it's good. I think the stress of getting ready for Europeans, when you then can bl be blamed for how many spots you get the next year and everything like that, oh, like, I think you that out. like don't go. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't define him, right? If he does well next year, no one's going to remember. Like, we're going to be like, oh, Kevin was going through These it. These are then. moments that are hard. And and this this would happen to me in, in opera moments too. It's that next thing in front of you seems too important. It's so hard to sort of zoom out in these moments and be like, mm -hmm. hey, listen, you're going to skip one Europeans. You're going to sort some stuff out. Or skip gonna... worlds. Skip the whole season. Yeah. Like, no one will it... remember you didn't go to Europeans, but yet each next thing feels so important like it, you absolutely could not even fathom the idea of skipping it and then but then there is also this perpetual idea that you are only as good as your last performance or your last program or whatever it is and it's like i just it's so hard i would imagine to have that perspective because i'm sure if you ask him he may want to do it because what he actually may may want to do is go and nail it but january 8th I mean, I just, I think it's a recipe for disaster. I would, for me, that would Any time to come down before he gets up and to deal with real stuff in that amount of time. And I wonder with, cause it's obviously very serious. Like it's it's substantial, whatever is going on, right? Like this is not a hang now, you know, this is stuff to dig. <laughs> it's gonna take some months, right? Like yeah, yeah. you need some time to <laughs> be in an ice rink and fall and cry and, you know, rebuild. But I think, for him, it's so interesting. In the past, he's taken all season to get to like his really good place. And then last year, he was at his really good place at Worlds. And then they did a bunch of shows. I don't think anything was training, but they had that World Team Trophy right after. And he performed well. This year, a lot this year already, this season. He was great at Skate America right at the beginning of the year in that free skate. And I wonder if now he's coming up against all of these self-belief. You remember how Calrie said that before the Grand Prix final? It was hard for her last year because she didn't feel like she deserved to win that Grand Prix final. This year she did, right? And I wonder for him, he started the year being so good at Skate America. And then every other time it's like you're coming up against your feeling of worthiness because you're already seeing oh my God, I skated great. And I'm not used to that, right? And then now that takes him to a different spot. So yeah, I, I, I think it's challenging. When you started skating well with you and Jason, Alyssa, were you like shocked? What was your reaction going from one competition to the next? No, it was it was interesting because when I first started with them, um, they sort of broke down all my technique and we, I spent the summer zamboniing up the ice. Um, which I was willing to do because I didn't really have so much technique. Like it just sort of, if it felt good, it felt good. And um, so then you get to competition and it's reliant on how you feel. And um, so when I got to my first competition, I was way not prepared for Skate Canada that year. Like I still was mopping up the ice. I was still trying to get this whole technique thing under my belt. And, um, but I, but I also was like starting to understand it a little bit. So I had no expectations going into ski camp. I mean, it was 10th at nationals, like far from making the Olympic team, far from being in first, like I was in 2009. So I, I didn't really go with expectations, except that I could see that there was a, 
there was a plan. So I trusted their plan and I trusted that like I would just keep working at it and I would get where I wanted to go. And so at Skate Canada that year, I, I was super nervous in the short, so it wasn't a great short, but it wasn't terrible. Like I didn't fall apart in the short. And then in the free skate, I had a little bit more trust in like, oh, if I just do this on this jump and this and just, which is what we had worked on all summer was all of that technique, but also like one thing to make this one happen, one thing to make this one happen. So I stood on my feet on almost everything. And I was like, this is really cool. Like I've never experienced this before. So it's it was less of something to trust. It's, it's, it's hard to trust. And you almost need a little bit of proof or encouragement to be like, yeah, it's safe to trust it. I promise. You yeah. Can't trust it. And it, it wasn't that I didn't trust my coaches. It was, I didn't trust myself that if I just did what the technique that they told me that it actually worked, like I just somehow never experienced that before. So it was less as a surprise to win is more of a surprise to like that there was something that everyone else maybe had that I never knew existed, mm -hmm. which sounds so stupid, but like, not you know. at all. Not, yeah. I think it's a very identifiable concept. Yeah. But also in that respect, like I had literally had the worst season of my life the year before, or when I started working with them and they continually told me that, they believed in me and they continually showed me that they believed in me. And they said, like, you know, we talked about the fact that people just called me a head case and they say, we can see that you're mentally strong. We can see that this is not the problem. So they didn't make me even emotionally feel like it was my fault or like I wasn't any good. So they worked, they were in a way that validating witness that I was talking about where they, they, as the adult in the room, made me confident in in them in myself in what i was doing and so the doubts that come in then you're stronger to fight them yeah i think that's true it's uh i think and it's soul searching for when you went to coaches who had one skater that did well but you don't obviously he's very talented you is very talented when you went to them that they were still not that household name so it's like taking the road less traveled too i had watched i had watched them that year with jeremy so you were confident because we trained at the same rink and I, I thought about it. I thought about every place that I wanted to maybe go. And, um, I just, there was something that felt right. And I had taken lessons from Yuka occasionally in the past when she was home from stars on ice. Um, and it just, she was never really coaching before Jeremy and I never considered asking, but then, you know, obviously they, she settled down and Jason and to coach full time. Um, and so it wasn't for me, it was like, I just, I trusted because also they had both had success of their own and they were never coaches that were looking for validation from their students. So you did well at that Skate Canada. Didn't you win your first Grand Prix at Skate Canada and you got a small medal at Junior Worlds at Skate Canada and now you're married <laughs> Canada? I'm just putting these together, Alyssa, that there's like a positive association with you in Canada. I, I had this 2000 and five wow. junior roads 2005 skate canada 2006 skate canada 2000 not 2007 i think i did something else there 2008 skate canada 2009 the four continents 2010 skate canada 2011 the final <laughs> i had a canadian tax number long before i was getting in canadian Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but also it's interesting because, and, and people obviously brought that up, like you always do well in Canada, but I always felt supported in Canada mm. because the audience is appreciative. Like in Japan, the audience is appreciative of good skating. They're, they're you know, of course, fans of who they're fans of, but when you're having a rough skate, a la Kevin at the Grand Prix final or something, you don't feel judged mm. by the fans as a person you more feel like they are sad for you and they are supporting you and they're going to like root for you even harder to do well at the next competition and that's I think a little bit what I felt in Canada was like I felt less uh I had less self-doubt because I didn't get the vibe of like people were like oh you have to prove yourself to be any good it was just like I could just be me there without where I don't know like this is, sounds like a weird thing to explain but no 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 it, it's actually making a lot of sense but I mean as as dark as my performance mine was working as I heard some people in the crowd at this French national mm -hmm. 
sort of start yelling like, ale, ale, like doing all this sort of stuff, trying to get behind him. I thought to myself, gosh, me as a performer would shut down even more. Because mm. I would mm. be like, oh my God, you're so bad. They have to like pick you up. This is so embarrassing. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I have heard like Kevin make those kinds of comments. There was one mm. French nationals who got like an astronomical score. And I remember Sylvia freaking out with him in the kiss and cry and looking to him and being like, oh my gosh, you got this big score. And him turning to her and be like, it's French nationals. It doesn't even count. Like mm. he was like, that score doesn't even matter. Like it's not a real score. And I, I just think there's probably a lot of underplaying. There's probably a lot of this stuff. I just, I think in those moments as a fan, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. The crowd is lifting them up. To me as a performer, it would make me even more embarrassed. I think I would shut down even more. Not that I'm saying like fans should not still attempt to pick mm -hmm. up. <laughs> I, I wonder that too, because I remember in Nice when I was falling and falling and I don't remember much of the performance, except that I literally could not turn it around I couldn't fix it and I just wanted to like never show my face again and I just wanted to get off yes but um I do remember that everyone in the stands like started clapping when I would get up which mm. is like you said slightly embarrassing because they're clapping for you to get up but at the same time it's like they appreciate your effort and they feel for you so it's not like it doesn't make it worse mm. in a way because yeah. you already know you're a disaster you're mopping up the ice you just like shouldn't be there in any respect mm. but it happens in in it's he finished the program and he kept trying and in at the grand prix final i had so much respect for him because he didn't let the program go at all right. like yeah. the intensity of the program to in like to fall and to fall apart like that and to not give up the program i mean he didn't do the anna Pogorelia where it was just like making it worse because it was bad which is also something that comes from maybe the people around you expecting you to be perfect. And you're like, well, I'm not perfect. So I might as well give up yes, and throw nothing. the baby out with the bathwater. Like exactly. So that, that is, I don't know. It's so important to people around you in these situations when you're really not an adult. Of course, I know that these people are adults or mostly adults, but you still need that person in your corner because you've grown up in this world where like you're judged as a person by your latest performance on the ice. No. Did Anna's coach hide behind the curtain when she skated? There's no well, way that that's like good energy. You know, there's this theory. That that's Karen, terrible. Karen Portland was telling me about theories that they have about energy and parents and kids. And she was saying that if a parent is so nervous when their kid performs that they can't send good energy to them, that it's better for them to not be in the arena because oh. the athlete picks up on how their dominant parent in that activity is performing. And I was thinking about, because we interviewed Dorothy Hamill, her mom was really nervous all the time and they had that contentious kind of relationship in training. And then she said, my mom didn't go and I came back and the room was filled with smoke and like, you know, my mom didn't see my performance, but like, in a way, if that theory is true, and I'm sure there are a million examples to contradict this, right? But if you believe in that theory, then that's a really interesting thing. If the parent wasn't there, did that free her, right? And I think about Nastia Lukin, who her mom was too nervous to watch her at the Olympics in Beijing, and she also did it. So there are those parents who are too nervous to watch, where maybe the relationship between mother and daughter isn't healthy, right? Because of the shared traumas of training and you think about all of these dynamics when you separate the parent from the kid and like why it could be a different way I, th I just thought it was like a really interesting theory we're also talking about like current dominant thought which she was talking about Brian Watano at like the Olympics and how have you changed the words you say to yourself and I always think I've always had coaches and maybe it's because they're not English speakers but I think everybody knows I'm a perfectionist and that like, that's my biggest thing to overcome, right? Like it's a great tool, but it also is something to overcome. And I've often had coaches that will be like, don't be nervous. Well, <laughs> you, when someone says that is nervous and don't stops you, right? Like this is an operatic concept. We talk about like vocally, like in technique is you cannot do a don't. 
So yeah. this idea of like, don't overblow this note. Don't slow down here. Don't, da, 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 da. I mean, it sounds, and I, when I first heard these concepts, I was like, oh, this is such like hipster dipster, like nonsense, like blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. But there's something really to it. If I gave myself an action, like just remember to do this here, it was so much easier than this sort of blockade of like, don't go flat on this sustained moment. Don't, it, because it's right yeah. there. Yeah. It also takes away the emotional connection to what you're doing. And I remember, so speaking of Brian Boitano, um, cause Linda Lever and Brian were my mentors for a while before I went to Yukon Jason and they were fantastic. But I remember at Worlds in LA when I had a bad program, bad tour program. Um, and I remember being, you know, like so upset that I didn't know how I was gonna do the long program. And, you know, our two spots or our three spots at the Olympics are riding on this and I've already ruined it and like the whole thing. And I remember Linda talking to me about it's like, like when you do your long program, it's like you open a door, you do the LM, you close the door. It's like checking a box when you do the bubble tests and you're just like, you fill in the bubble and then you leave it. And so, and I wonder if maybe that, and Brian was so consistent, but maybe he was never emotionally involved in that way of like, if I miss this, then I'm a disaster. If I miss, like you just, because you learn those things, right? But if he was, if he was always taught by Linda, who was always his coach, that you do this, like it's just a check checkbox, right? So you're not, you check it, you check it, you check it. And you just, you start to not think I'm a terrible person if I miss this jump or like I miss this jump. You just, you do it, you do it. And that's the same thing in a different way that Yuka and Jason taught me was to think about what I needed to do for the jump technique. So then you stop, like you just don't, your brain can't hold those other thoughts, like don't fall <laughs> or what is that judge going to think of me? Or am I going to make the final or, you know, does my mom still love me? Or like, you know, whatever sort of thoughts they're gone because you don't have space in your brain. You only have enough space to, to check each box as you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and like, obviously it worked for Brian, that's for sure. I find with figures training them, it's so interesting because you think like you're just doing a circle, but like each part of the circle has something that you have to think about. And there's some like continuous motion that, that can also be impacted by what you did on the curve before. So you don't get a good push, you don't get a good here, then you're doing this, then you're checked and you're riding the toe pick because you're trying to force it, right? So what you're doing and going from like the two circles to the serpentine when you do three is like, astronomically more complicated because you're changing. so hard right yeah yeah and i just realized like there's only so much information that i can absorb at each time to focus on things because my brain the mm -hmm. way it works like i can like obsess and then get comfortable here and then i'll get better here right but if i try to think of it all at the same time it's just like overloaded and we're filming them at the same time so then there's that too <laughs> you know like so <laughs> Yeah, I learned a very interesting thing this last Stars on Ice tour because I was extraordinarily injured and wanted to finish the tour because it was Kurt's last tour and I wasn't allowed to jump um, because of my injury. But it hurt so much that I really, some days I was like, I'm just going to, like, I can't finish this tour. I just want to go home. Um, I didn't know if I could make it through my program. Literally, like physically. I didn't, it, everything hurts so much with the injury that I was just like, I don't, I, you know, I can barely warm up for the program. I can't walk cause it hurts. Um, and I like, it's one thing to do a competition and you're like, I'm injured. I just, I can't skate. I'll have to pull out like whatever, but this is a show where like people are paying to see you skate and you either show up or you don't. And I was like, literally because how emotional is it when you're all represented by the same agency and you're also competing against the other girls of who are your peers about who's getting the invitations for the show, right? Is that still like a real thing when it comes to that it, it is, and obviously if you don't skate well or, you know, like you're not getting invited back the next year. But this for me was like literally about making it to the end because I wanted to be there with Kurt and for him. But every single night for the 15 of the 20 shows that I was injured I didn't know if I could make it through the program and it's a wild thing to like literally have to stay with every single step mm -hmm. like of course that's what you're taught and you know stay in the present and do this but I literally had no other choice and so it was a, a, a kind of an eye-opening experience of how 
literally this is what they mean by stay in the present. And I had to do it 15 times because I didn't know if I was going to make it through. I literally was like, I'm going to fall apart and not make it through this program. Hmm. Which fortunately didn't happen. And there were a couple of days where it felt a little bit better, but not something I ever want to experience again, but I learned so much by having to force myself to do that. We spent a lot of time on this. We didn't really talk about Kimmy Rapond, who did win Swiss National. She's coming back from an yes. injury. Did you wonder if she's still injured? I just noticed that in her low back and in her movement, the jumps looked tight. And I noticed that her low back didn't look completely free. To me, it looked- What was her injury? I noticed that the layback in the free program was just a side layback in the field. So there's clearly a back injury. If that has, I don't know if that's what has been happening. I don't know what she said. I was just looking at even her stroking and her back crossovers. And I felt like there was, she was inhibited in her movement and her low back. And I thought- But she skated I, very well. And I but, think, I, I wanted to go back and watch your pins from last year because um, you can't tell on the screen, but she's gotten very tall. Like, <laughs> But yet somehow she's able to corral her limbs better than last year. She's gotten a maturity- this year I think that like she's finishing her lines and she's spending more time which I really love to see considering that she's probably still injured or hasn't had a full training time it was quite a good program but the jumps and the uh, definitely the layback I noticed a little bit of carefulness yeah and the footwork her edges seemed flat-ish for her like not the depth of the lean could have been much better and I think she's capable of it I just know that because yeah. Paul is you have my attention to detail, a flat edge out, coming out of a curve is something that he will point out. Oh, that's so <laughs> now like I'm so in tune about myself and the edge. And listen, he has this theory that if you start the program on a deep edge, it's going to give better information to your brain and actually help your jumps versus eating into your edge. You're going to be tighter and more conservative and it's not going to help your skating. So and it's just interesting because I changed some moves so I can give more edge at the beginning that I was feeling uncomfortable with. It, it's just an interesting concept, right? And I noticed for her that she, I thought she was inhibited. And then I, like I noticed when she was doing her loops during her footwork sequence that she just mm -hmm. looked like she was fighting her body and it looked a little flat-ish. Considering that she has been injured, like to stand up on all those jumps is quite impressive i did notice though like more than anything that i thought that she's matured as a skater and i the the second half of the long program looked not as strong as the first half just choreographically or expressive wise but i liked the beginning of her long program a lot and i thought that like i think that if assuming that she has is recovering that um i'm excited to see her at worlds i think that if she can work on her body and open up where those inhibitions are in the low back and the hips and the ankles and strengthen them, that she could be a really major skater with a, like a really like iconic kind of look if she has the right team behind her to put her together. Who, who are the other women? Obviously the two Belgian women, um, Lena and Nina. And then- By the way, Alyssa, sometimes your shade goes over everyone's head, but there was She's a- not clip. shady. She's not shady. Oh, Jonathan. No, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. But it, last week, this clip was sent to me. I watched. Okay. What did I say? I pointed out that Luna, that Nina thinks that she can beat Luna. And Alyssa goes, that's funny. And then she just like moved on. Like it was such. It was funny that that would be a quote that was given. That's what she was referring to. I'm, I'm with Alyssa her. was just like, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, I, I just don't think I know how to answer that. Great. Wait, 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 did you ever see the Olympic? Did you ever see the Olympic Channel documentary about Montreal? I mean, there were so many hidden gems in there. I mean, really, like the great one of the great shows, right? And Madison Hubble was like obsessed with thinking that she could be Papadakis and Cizeron. And as much as I love Hubble and Donahue, my inner Alyssa Sisney was like, that's funny. Okay. And then we keep watching, you know? <laughs> and I was like, and I think that they are phenomenal, but I yeah. thought that they were at no risk of beating them based yeah. on what we saw in competitions, right? I thought, that's funny. Okay. And like, but you know, Papadakis wasn't mad at her because she agreed with Alyssa too. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, but. Oh, yeah. Aside from Nina and Lena, and then is Kimmy really, I'm trying to think who else would be challenging Kimmy for that potential bronze medal spot at Europeans. The girl that represents Georgia. 
Oh, yes, of course. Of course. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, I knew I was, must have been forgetting someone. Okay. But she has had a wildly inconsistent fall um, where she was really bad at Lombardia and then pretty decent at her first Grand Prix. And sometimes program to program within an event, one would work. It really feels well. like that a little bit, which seems so strange because she has that Russian technique. And it's very strange to see someone with Russian technique missing. It's just because we don't, right? Because then Russians never seem to miss. Um, so it was not unexpected, just weird to see that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Have you seen the video of Papadakis and Cicerone training with the Paris Ballet? They were like- What? Oh, I no, I haven't. I want to watch this. Okay. So they're like talking about coming back and their movement style did look very different and they do look to be in good shape. He looks ready like right now. Right, to come back and I'd ask Marie Franz, do you think they will? I think that it's like their destiny to come back because I was thinking if you're as good as they are and you're watching the field and you're like, no one is great right now. I don't think they're watching the field. I wonder if they're getting bored. Yes, they have to be because anytime they actually go to work on exhibition programs in Montreal, they'd mm -hmm. be seeing the best in the world, right? They'd be looking at talking baits. And you'd be saying to yourself on some level, well, I could beat that, you know, like, come on. If you know, if you know that that's the world champion and you're going to get an exhibition and you're seeing the world champion in the rink, I think you would, I, I cannot imagine that your brain, even if you're not consciously thinking of it, it's not like, well, we could beat them, you know, like, come on. I, I do. It depends on, I think for them, it depends on what their life is like now, because, you know, being competitive and working towards that next Olympics is all consuming and you have to sacrifice a lot. And if you've entered the real life and you're like, this is great. Like I can have a balance in my life. Then, then they're not going to want to come back. Um, but maybe what recently where she was talking about that exact thing, where she was like, it has been so refreshing to be out of the, of the grind, but she did leave it open as in like a, for now, it's nice to, to just step away for a moment. Well, I find that because social media has made so many people quasi stars, right? You almost need to do more to become, to have that lasting career. Because if you don't, there's always someone else that could come and replace you, right? Like Johnny's the commentator and then Adam comes along. Johnny's going to feel like Adam could take my place at any moment, right? That's one thing. That listening to Adam's commentary, I enjoy it. Yeah. Think about for them, right? They are top ice dancers. They won an Olympic gold medal. They also have a silver. But skating isn't huge in France right now. They are doing shows in Japan and they are doing shows there, but there are only so many slots in Japan. How do you how do you make sure your professional career goes on four more years to buy you time and build other projects? You win another Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Right? It's, it's depends on if that's what they want. If they want to continue skating, then that probably is the most conceivable way for them to do it because they could likely easily win and then you get asked to do the shows for another four years or whatever um but if you don't desire that you yeah. know what i mean like it's there's certainly the question about whether or not they're the best is certainly i don't think the question we're asking is like are they willing to like scott and tessa come back and be better or or sacrifice everything to get to the next Olympics. I believe that they should. And I think that we all need to manifest it. Ouija boards, stage, every, everything. Okay, the sport needs mega stars to come back and they are that talented to be that iconic, whether they are as famous as other skaters like a Yuna or a Yuzu, they are that level, right, of skater. And I think this sport is in desperate need of someone to like, get excited about. And I think that they would present that. And I think that people would get excited and that it would change the energy in the room. Because when, also if the Russians come back, right? If the Russians are already allowed back as neutrals, you know they're coming back at some point, right? So I think that you need this to kind of counterbalance that energy to be like, yes, 
And you still know that even if Papadakis and Zizaran come back and make skating really exciting next year, if there is one Russian in the event and she skates well, you will get the fans to be like, see, you needed the Russians. They were the answer to everything. It's more than just one person. You need many stars and storylines and interest and things like that. But I think that, yes, this is what will happen in the future. But yes, I'm team them coming back. Yeah. Playing the devil's advocate, though, remember like, in the Sasha era when she was always in the shadow of Michelle Kwan is like, can the sport move on if the people stick around for, if the top people stick around for so long, for example, like, you know, whoever's coming up and dance behind, I don't know if Piper and Paul are continuing to the Olympics. I don't know if Maddie and Evan are continuing to the Olympics. Um, I do hope that both are because I think that they do bring the excitement and the rivalry that we wouldn't have otherwise, but if Papadakis and Cicero come back, then are we losing other skaters that might, like we were talking about with the Russians where people weren't meddling, so they weren't going the extra step to, you know, I don't know how to, we were talking about this before though, like when, when you know that someone is clearly the best and you're never going to be beat them, are, do you care as much? Do you work as hard? Do you put in the effort to be as creative as if you're just gonna like, I think you have never to gonna win. Madison Hubble and Nina, and think that you can, mm -hmm. even if you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why, yeah. like, even, even though, yes, the idea of N Nina beating Aluna it seems a little bit funny. If that's what keeps her striving and growing, yeah. and it's it's also what's interesting is that the dance field that's been left now has also already been established. That's so this is like, true. So yeah, not like there's a new. That's like trying to break through and be big stars. True, right now. So true. That have been playing second field fiddle, sort of to them, trying to have their moment now. I guess so. That's why I might view it a little bit differently. That Alyssa, makes sense. How do you think we were robbed having trained at the same rink of Hubble and Donahue, and just seeing that on the daily. How much were we robbed by not seeing them go against Chalk and Bates for that world title last year? Like be neck and neck all year, all day. Like how excited. <laughs> Ben. I ben. love love watching Maddie and Zach. They they just I think they they bring an excitement to dance that's not always there because maybe aggressive is not the right word, but the way they skate is so full of excitement and so different than the pretty skating that dance has often seen. And I think Maddie is Maddie Hubble is one of the strongest ice dancers I've ever met. But like there's something special about her skating and with Zach. I mean, she was great with Kiefer as well. Like, I don't want to to say that they were not great. It was just that they Kiefer were not was supported. A good skater. Yeah. Yeah. They were not supported being a brother and sister team. So that wasn't pair, going to happen. By the way, he does, adult, he does adult pairs. I know. Yeah. yeah he's He was um, struggling with the Topics for a while. He wasn't like, used to having Topics and he kept tripping. So he, he shaved the bottoms of them down a little bit because he's used to dance, right? And he didn't want to be like, in a lift. He didn't want to be a lift. And yeah, he's great. He's fantastic. Like he might be the better Hubble of the skaters. I think they're, I mean, both of them, whether it's like their own genetics of what they were gifted with or whoever taught them basics. He has like a scissor on quality now that he does all that yoga. I mean, have you seen like he can bend himself as a pretzel, yes, right? I've seen it with him. <laughs> yeah. And then he got like, he had this like short, haircut going on in Delaware he was he was in his prime it was yeah it was like who's that you know when you see someone and you recognize them but you haven't seen them in a really long time but they've changed like aspects and I was like who is that you know and he was doing pairs and yeah, yeah. It was a, so yeah I, I'm I think that they will come back and that they should come back I think that this is I don't, what do you think Jonathan do you think that they will oh, come back sure. you know I I, I have always loved what I have always bought what they are selling. Always, always, yeah. always. So I, and they, I am they've so changed cool. the sport of ice dance. So I would love to see having been out in the real world away from the competitive sphere and maybe they maybe they're re-inspired in a different way. I would love to see how they come back because they are trailblazers for sure. I like how the Browns post every day that they're in Montreal, that they're training there. And that's like a subliminal message to us that they're moving up in the world. I want to know if they'll move there full time, like maybe with Joel Deere, because he's one of the top specialists 
in the US who's highly regarded. And I was thinking like it worked for them now, like they have, um, you know, both teams helping them, but what happens in the future? Like if he moved there, would that make I am even stronger? And hmm. is it possible? I think it's- I, would, I can't wait to see what they do. Cause they're speaking of Maddie and Zach being strong, aggressive, powerful skaters. I believe they are also, I mean, we did a show with them a couple of years ago and they got out on the ice to, I think it was rehearsal or practice or some little warm up for the show. I can't remember which, what. And I just was like, yeah, they were two steps and you're like, man, are they good. She's just, also just, powerful she's as a coach. She, there's a juvenile boy that I think is moving up to intermediate that I skate with. And he's a talent. And like Madison Hubble has been recruiting him from like moment one that she started coaching. Cause she's trying to get like the under, you know, to build up like your grassroots. Mm -hmm. And every time she sees them at a competition, like in Lake Placid or what, like her eye is on that boy and she makes sure to talk to him at every competition. Like, I okay. bet she's a great coach. Oh yeah. Come on. Yes. I bet she's such a great coach. She's tough and positive and in your face. And yeah, of course she's good, right? It's like how you know that Alexa would be a tough coach. Of course she is, right? Like and also encouraging. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I took a lesson with Alexa over Zoom during COVID. Mm. Clam shells together and like shoot the dog. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. I wor I worked out with her once in um Colorado at altitude. And I thought I was going to pass out because I was seeing black spots and I, I was not going to quit. I was like, we're going, we are going. Like it was Delilah's son's gym. Okay. There was no way I was quitting in front of that. All right. Come on. That energy, please. Like this is, yeah. Anyway, it was fun. Anyway. So verdict on Kevin Europeans. Are you for going against going, Jonathan? What is your plan for Kevin? I think he's got knowing the date. I think he has to wait. That is my vote. But also knowing we don't know what we don't know, he's going to have to make the right decision for him. I personally, on the outside, would think it's best to wait. How about you, Alyssa? What are you thinking? I agree. I think that I, I don't think World should be his next competition, though. So if there's anything that he can do when he's ready before Worlds to put him on his feet, or or if what if what is best for him is skipping Worlds, recovering dealing with everything feeling better like i don't we don't know what's going on and, and maybe if the olympics is his goal which i hope it is because i want to see him compete for two more seasons or whatever it is two and a half um you know to take what he needs to do to 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 heal and come back stronger you know missing this world of all worlds is not make it or break it so i went on a yoga retreat in Kauai and the first thing we did is we all sat down and we drank cacao and people claimed that it had like these properties that made them super emotional. I felt nothing, but everyone around me was crying, which then made me feel really out of body because everybody's crying and I'm not and everyone's having like these emotions. But I think Kevin needs like one of those experiences where he travels alone, gets on like some retreat on an island, gets away from the world, still moves his it body. down, yeah, to process, yeah. yeah. And reset. And then take and I hope, and I hope that he knows that like he has so much support in the skating world. I mean, I think Sylvia makes that clear, right? I think that she's <laughs> she's. And you know what? To like in in the big picture of things, how he does in skating doesn't matter. No, you know what so I mean. Like it doesn't affect who he is as a person. It doesn't affect how we feel about him as a person, of course I want him to do well, of course I want him to win, of course I want him to be successful, but like it doesn't change him as a person or how he should feel about himself or in the rest of his life. Like skating is a blip in the radar. Yeah, I think he's iconic enough at this point that he'll have a career as a choreographer and coach and performer. Absolutely. happens from the step forward, so. We want to know what you think and what you're looking forward to because next week it's Russian and Japanese nationals. What a Christmas gift to all of us. Alyssa, thank you for coming. You are going to be performing on New Year's Eve in Stowe, Vermont. I'm going to come. Apparently and the 29th in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Well, I'm not coming the 29th. <laughs> 
that time to IDI. Apparently they skate like two shows at this outdoor rink, Jonathan. There are like fireworks. You get to see, are you doing experience? I wish. No, we're not. We're just doing, oh, no, we're, yeah, no. Well, Jonathan's doing experience. <laughs> I need to tell Doug and like yell at him? Do I, like, why are we not doing it? Emily Schmidt's going to be there, you said? And maybe yes. I was, I'm here for all of this, but like. It's what? not so much the group work that we do for this one. It's more of a, just a, a put on a performance for the people at the. Um, what are you skating? Pardon? What are you skating? I like to watch you skate experience. You should always be wearing that. I always want to skate. Do you know why I, I figured out? I mean, I love it so much because it's spectacular and the music is amazing. Cindy Stewart choreographed All those it. men lifting you, Alyssa. All those <laughs> handsome men. Is, <laughs> is my IDI boyfriend lifting you in that program? That one? He is? Yeah. Well, and I, um, but Cindy Stewart choreographed that piece and she's a lefty skater. And it's, the, I think, the first time in my life that I've had a lefty choreographer and everything in that program feels so good. And then I realized I'm like, oh, it's because like it's supposed to feel good. She goes my direction. Is this what other people feel like in all of their programs? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> the, the the struggles of a lefty skater. This is incredible. my waltz jump was also lefty, so fear not. Was it really? No way. <laughs> We're gonna take Jonathan skating. Yes, Jonathan, we should take you skating. God, you know, I tried to like do it again at like Sky Ring a couple years ago. And um, there were a couple of very sweet people that like recognized me from TSL. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is <laughs> like, no one sees me moment. Like I just need to feel comfy again. Like, come on now. <laughs> I was so tired in Potsdam and Paul made sure everybody knew that oh, that's from TSL coming. And it was like- Like, not that time, Paul. This is not that moment. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, and then he was like, one tough thing after another on Friday. Let's do this! <laughs> yeah! Oh, my God. Yeah, it was that kind of a day. <laughs> oh, when you want to be under the radar in Potsdam. That was- yeah. <laughs> Or just think so. Like, honestly, that university, Clark University, has the most gorgeous rink to skate at. Like- I want to go back so but literally driving there 90 minutes to two hours pitch black back roads snow on the ground no reception for 30 minutes on end winding roads and signs for deer and moose that could like wreck your car at any moment so and then like <laughs> finally come into civilization it's like the shed store <laughs> right and you're like that's the first light i've seen on the side of the road for like a really long... you know it's really emotional when you have when you cut off cell reception and you feel like you are alone alone quite the journey right so <laughs> Pull the edge, it looks sexy, everyone. I know.